That look all right? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, there might be some more people that trickle through, trickle in. I was looking at the doodle poll, and most everybody who said they'd be here is here. Even some that said they wouldn't be here, like Sullivan and Scott, came anyway. So. Oh, you just filled out the doodle poll, and when they changed the date, you were just marked as not being able to attend today. So, we're glad you're here. Uh, let's go around the room just to introduce ourselves, uh, just to make sure we're all familiar. Let's start over here. Brass Jackson, Science Port City. Rob Lundry, Provo City. Morgan Faulkner, Portion Burns, St. Lewis. Water. Mike Rouse, Central Utah Water Conservancy District. Scott Daly, Division of Water Quality. I'm Reed Price with Orem. Uh, Eric Ellis with Utah Lake Commission. Sam Rager, Utah Lake Commission. Josh Holt, Park Manager here Park. Sarah Carroll, Saratoga Springs. Andrews Bay, Sullivan of Finger City. All right. Welcome, everyone. We'll begin. Um, by looking at the minutes from both our meeting, Juan, welcome. Uh, reviewing the uh, minutes from our September 2018 and November, September 19th, 2018, and November 28th, 2018 uh, meeting minutes. Eight days in advance, just want to throw that uh, out there. <laughs> well, plenty I of learned time. my lesson on having them ready. <laughs> Anybody have any? Uh, Comments, questions about the minutes? Okay, look for a motion to approve both sets at once, then. I move we approve both sets of minutes to the meeting September 19th, 2018, and November 28th, 2018. Second. I got a second. Is that Mike? Yeah. Any uh, further discussion? Those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, minutes passed. Um, I, uh, not, not a note uh, to, to change, but as I was reviewing the minutes, um, there was there was mention in the September or in the November minutes about the Lincoln Beach property survey. I never, we never got. I don't remember seeing any information on that and in the minutes suggested that we would get the survey. I, I don't know if, if that's that completed or if that's still in process. The survey, there was a, it was sent out to this group as a survey. I don't remember the governing board as well. I don't remember seeing that. Did you? Yeah. Uh, we had a great uh, response. No, yeah. I, yeah, it's been. I, would have been no, in September. December. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I must have just glanced through it. So, but you can. can well, I didn't see anything on here. Perhaps you could touch so on that. So we do have the Lincoln Beach update from the county okay, down Okay. So we here. can touch on that. What the survey said yeah. there. Okay. Okay. All right, Eric. We'll turn the time over to you for uh, director's update. Yeah. Yeah, part of that. Okay. Uh, lake level. Uh, last I looked at the chart, we were at about 3.6 feet below full, which is a really good place to be considering the snowpack levels that we're at. Uh, yesterday I checked, probably changed again today, but we are in the ballpark of 140% of average uh, for the Provo River area. Uh, statewide, it, the, the state is doing great. Our southern Utah areas are... are have snow like they haven't seen in a long time. They're at 170 percent of average uh, for the southwestern and the southeastern is really close to that. Uh, the only place that's just barely above average is the Raft Rivers up on the northwest side of the state, but that's a really tiny little piece for Box Elder County. So uh, it's exciting to see so much snow in the mountains for all kinds of reasons, but. But presumably we'll, we'll get pretty close to full this year, maybe even full. And um, we don't expect to necessarily change the algae bloom regime because of it, but uh, 
but it is good to have the lake full because it makes the at least the initial part of the summer prior to any blooms uh, being really successful for all of our our lake um, businesses and and marinas and operators. So. Eric, I was just going to ask if you thought it would fill. We were looking at water elevation data the other day, and 16 to 17, the increase was uh, 4.6 feet from October to June at the mm -hmm. maximum. So big water year. This is a big one. Yep. Yeah. I don't <coughs> and that year, the, 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 the fall uh, precipitation also helped a lot because prior to that, October, it had been at its... But it's Nadal, I guess, down to what eight feet below full, right. like and it came. I mean, in one year, it came up yeah. eight feet total. But that's if you were to look at the the bottom versus the peak. So kind of splitting lines. So we can. You're saying we can well, likely just, expect yeah. maybe close to four feet. That's so. just one year and one snowpack. Yeah. We did have a lot of low elevation rain this winter, right? Yeah. So, really good news in, in the water quantity area. We had a water resources. Any comments on water conditions? Um, just really good. Um, I contacted a bunch of people about the potential for flooding because we were asked that question, and everyone says we're looking good, but we have like a good water supply, but it's not going to be like a scary runoff. Okay. So far, that's how it's looking. But. We've. I, where where is the snow mostly located? Is it mid to high? We currently have it low, but, I, but there's not I, a lot. I don't know all the statistics. Are okay. Low, but probably mid to high. Okay. Yeah, it's it's fun to watch the snow on a good year because it just it's impressive. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, budget requests. So this year. Uh, the county for this is for Fragmites work done around the lake. Uh, the county puts in a an application to the Department of Ag for their invasive mitigation fund, uh, and they put in. We match that usually, so they put in a request for 165,000, and that was well within the ranking uh, ranked for funding area. So that should come. Uh, we put in a. A request from Division of Wild or Division of Natural Resources Department, uh, their Watershed Restoration Initiative for 164,000, uh, and that ranked out first in our region, uh, and so that will be funded. And the county also puts in. Uh, I think their in kind is somewhere in the ballpark of 51,000 this year, so it's overall. 400 and some odd thousand dollar project and that will just continue as you know the por the priorities half of the lake from Saratoga Springs City Marina up around the north tip of the lake all the way down into Provo Bay uh, and that's, for that's for frag mighty yeah uh, the mowing we're going to talk about that in a second maybe I skipped that for a minute yeah I'll talk about that in a second so that covers both the mowing of the Phragmites and the chemical treatment. So uh, it's exciting to see it actually starting to, I don't know, become manageable, if you will. Uh, historically, we just haven't been able to hit enough each year to feel like we were making a dent in it. What, what are the acronyms? WRI? So Watershed Restoration Initiative, and that's the second one is the Utah Department of Agriculture and Foods, and it's... ISM or Invasive Species Mitigation Fund dollars. Uh, the Utah Lake uh, Commission this year has put in a request into the budget, at least in our tentative or preliminary budget, that's just gone through one level of, it's gone through our executive committee, but it's been approved so far and supported, uh, to add 30000 of our capital projects fund towards uh, shoreline improvement projects. So presumably these would be access, you know, adding sand or doing uh, some projects. I know that most of our marinas have uh, access uh, enhancement plans already. Saratoga Springs has one, American Fort Boat Harbor does, the State Park does. 
and, and even Lincoln Beach is in the process of developing one of those, uh, or at least developing I ideas and plans for expansion down there. Uh, and then when we ran this past the county, the county commission is also very supportive of getting some projects to, completed to improve access points around the lake. So if, if you have ideas or projects that are being planned or that have been planned and want a year where there's going to be some uh, really good matching funds, this is the year to do it. We have the, the county will uh, likely not just match, but even bigger than match any project that we put a few thousand dollars towards. They're excited to make these things happen. So if you have one of those types of projects, let me know. Uh, after these, those, the, the funds that we're budgeting for will be available after July 1st. Uh, but let's figure out what those projects are before then and we can start uh, presenting those. Every two months the county meets to discuss funding that could be available for this. And so we can uh, put together a proposal and uh, combined we can go present those uh, with your city or your entity and the commission uh, to see if we can't get uh, some really good matching dollars to come into that project as well. So, Is that money the recreation tax uh, that the county would put in? <clears throat> TRT? Yeah. yeah. That's one that they just committed a $4 million to the airport, I think. It is. So they said, and, and at the same, have the same conversation, they said, hey, we just put a bunch of dollars into this, into the airport down at the lake. That's not the only thing we need to improve down there. Good. And so they tell didn't, us what to do. So they didn't devote all of the money to... That's not what it sounded like. Oh, good. Good. I was concerned. I don't know how much money they get, but when I saw that, I thought that's a big chunk of money. Yeah, Is there going to be anything available for other stuff or not? <laughs> no, that. For the ramp. Oh, what? She's what project what you were aware of? Oh, Saratoga Springs has a master plan for the marina. Oh, for the other jetty. So, so it's both. You have a, the plan includes an additional jetty, uh, a beach where that additional jetty would be, uh, and then expansion expansion work up through the property up towards the gate yeah. uh, to kind of make that more usable. Instead of right now, it's not really used at all. I don't know if you're getting funds. This the plan was put together what three years ago or more. So this, so that's the idea. Is that most of the access points have plans like that, okay. but they're usually phased because funding has not been available historically for any of the phases. So now would be a good time for us to let you know. That's what Eric, su that. oh, okay. Eric suggesting. Okay, I didn't know if what you, what you, what you said meant that there was already some funding for that, or if we need to be requesting that. He's okay. he's ready to endorse any projects that you have oh, and well, help you bring them to the. Yeah, and it's usually much easier when you can say, "Hey, look." If we've got any funding at all to go towards this, we, yeah. we, there are already funding mechanisms that are eager and ready to help leverage those dollars. So is this a match? Is, or is, it, is it a grant style thing? Or, I mean, how he said he, he indicated it's a, a match works better, but the county commission has indicated that they're willing to enhance their yeah. match. So okay. the, the, the commissions will likely be like a one-to-one -one match, yeah. but since the county is likely already going to commit that other half, okay. whatever the city can come up with, I mean, it's, it's the opportune time to, to just leverage dollars. So any, any dollar that the city can bring to the table can likely bring two or three back. Okay, I'll pass it on. Awesome. Tell them vineyard dips and money dips. <laughs> How do we let you know? Do we send project details to you with a budget, or how do what's, what do we do? What's that? Oh, well, for now, let's let's just start the conversation. Okay. So bring it back to staff and or council and say, hey, what do we? There's this opportunity. What project could we or would we like to pursue this year? Um, let's let's find a priority project down there on the shoreline, and then start talking to us about what that is and we can figure out who has what dollars and okay. 
start presentations. I know Sarah Tyler's ramp is too steep. Maybe that's been addressed a little bit already. Hmm. Do you know? Well, Better I'll, traction tires. I'll talk to our people. Well, it's too steep, so when the water's low, you can't launch because at the angle of ascent, you're going to bottom out. Oh, at the bot when it hits the level yeah. of the lake? Yes. Huh. It's like, right. So at this point, you're going to bottom out. So. Mother Nature may have addressed the problem this year, but in future yeah. years, it will <laughs> likely still be one. Okay, we will talk. Okay. Uh, the Wakara Way Project. Uh, I think, ha who has not heard of the Wakara Way Project? One, a few more. Okay, so the Wakara Way Project is a vineyard, uh, vineyard, orem, provo, potential, uh, multi-jurisdictional uh, uh, project. Oh, yeah, it's Okay, I didn't know the name, but... Uh, what it will be long-term, and, and I wanted to kind of ask this group what else to ask for. So at this stage, it's private landowners on the north end of this potential project area that are hoping to leave a legacy type project uh, from all of their relatives because it's a whole family that owns property on that <coughs> north end. And this is the portion out by the lakeshore that's not developable uh, but has potential for uh, park-like wetland slash uh, park environment. Uh, It'll, at the end of the day, it'll probably be close to a thousand acres. Uh, the agreement will facilitate an, a trail easement, a public trail easement. Uh, at this stage, they're talking likely public access throughout the park area. So some portions will be natural or improved natural. Uh, some areas will be um, actually park. So they're intending to have some camping or RV type stuff down there. Uh, how, how does this fit into the Delta Restoration? Is this starting about the south end, or it would be north end, I guess, far to the north end of it? So, okay. so it won't it, like the project boundary may end up bumping up against the the Pro River Delta project, mm -hmm. um, but not like that'll be for <clears> sure the natural end of it. So. We've been talking with Division of Wildlife Resources, and they're interested in, in enhancing some of that area for um, waterfowl. Uh, and so how we you know, use the, the restoration dollars to improve wetland habitat uh, would be how we would address that south end of the project. Um, but having the trail down through there uh, has the potential to be just an amazing uh, trail resource for the communities that are neighboring. What else would we like? So, so right now they envision uh, a nice trail down the middle, potentially a soft trail for equestrian use down one side, probably down the west side, but that's not relevant right now, uh, with access points periodically out to the lakeshore, and then also access points periodically because there will likely need to be a fence on the east side of this short of the trail to prevent... <coughs> cows from coming out so the idea is that we this this whole area becomes a grazed uh, area for Phragmites management so we're doing a test pilot this year just on the very north end the the holdaway property uh, that's maybe 80 acres or something like that we're going to try grazing that much like is done in in Ogden Bay and in Farmington Bay uh, they've had great success using uh, cows to keep the Phragmites down and kind of it, it allows grasses and other things to come back, uh, and it will be temporary grazing, so they'll, they'll rest, rotate, so that it stays real healthy. Uh, uh, and that would allow equestrian or, or just people out walking to, at certain points, uh, have a little gate to get into that big, open, just natural area uh, to walk around or, or ride around. So that's yeah, just because it ch touches those jurisdictionally. Okay, I'm trying to see on a map. Which families? Which it's primarily? It's the fold away Clegg, okay. Daryl Clegg, families. Does it go down to He's Taylors right. and Clingers? Yeah. And it would go down so that the that far, yeah. Are so the Taylors and Clegg? Are the Taylors and Clingers? The, not all the families. Not all the families have 
have signed on, so to speak, yet. But it's it's because we have a family member, and they're all quite tied together. That's that's pitching this. It is getting a lot of traction so far with the families that have been worked with. So. Where did the name come from? The Wakara Way. The Wakara. Uh, Jake Holdaway. Chief the, Wakara. Yeah. The, you try to think. Yep. Oh, is there an L in there or no? Yeah. Okay. There's also, there's also been discussion with the, with the Native American tribes and stuff to create some learning areas where they'll actually put up some Because it would be the south end of this project. Yeah. Have some the north end of the yeah. 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 So it'll have some historic farm, some prehistoric not going together, right? uh, yeah. areas. The Ute tribe. So they they spoke at the uh, at a recent conference with the Ute tribe, and they said we'd love to participate and have some sort of interpretive signage and and or areas down in that area. So nice. I was recently up there in uh, Seattle area. We went to a park that joins uh, Puget Sound. Oh yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you've been to that. Home place. turf. It's your home turf. Yeah. So it was really cool to see how they had a. Uh, explanation of the different species, and the, but it was not no vehicles, no horses, just all walking. Okay. Everybody whispering. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no whispering. Right next to the no shush zone. To the cranes and the there was some bald eagles. We went on a, a, a little tour day for yesterday, and we actually after we were walking back we were getting, uh, food out. Okay. The tree there. Paid little attention to us until after we were past. There's a lot of wildlife there. So having having just walked it, tell us your your experience thinking about having a trail in that area. So there's an incredible amount of land available there, and there's kind of a natural ridge right adjacent to the existing water line that not in the deal. Kind of a sandbar. The full truth of that, but they say the water doesn't go over that. But because there's some lower areas, allows water to get kind of around behind that. But also, what happens is the natural drainage from the properties uh, further east of that is is that water can't get to the lake, so it's kind of trapped in this area, which allows you know the frag mites to just grow like crazy. And the understanding is the frag frag mites you know take up a lot of water, so if that water could you know, be allowed to actually get to the lake could help, you know, enhance the lake, you know, whatever little bit that could do. But there is a, there is a beautiful little uh, elevated shoreline there that would be a perfect place for a trail. Plus, it would kind of give a natural boundary, you know, a definitive boundary between owners, you know, lake owners and state owners and whatever state lands and, and then, uh, uh, private owners. But, uh, there, there's a fascinating amount of land there be put to use. And within that area, there are some areas that are, that are quite elevated above uh, the rest of the low-lying areas, which would lend itself to the campgrounds and, and other yeah. facilities, uh, recreational facilities and stuff like that. It and does look pretty wet on this map. It can be. Yes, it can. Yeah. It can get very muddy. They just discovered there. that yesterday as well. <laughs> 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 but, but it really is a, an amazing resource that's currently been untapped because most of it's private and or just un inex unaccessible. And, well, and the historical access from that has always been used in grazing and stuff in the years past. Yep. Uh, there's, there's roads there that actually have some, some solid base to them that were accessed by the farmers in, in the early days. So, uh, there's, there's some infrastructure in place for access. You know how they have those LaGrace boardwalk trails on a section of the river in Marie? That's really a pretty area. I wonder if, uh, so there's a few spots along this trail alignment that will require a boardwalk because they're they're always wet. Yeah. And so it would be a kind of a mix. Uh, the, the hope is that most of it is not boardwalk because boardwalk <laughs> elevates the cost substantially. Um, but I think that it had... It'll, it'll be a really attr attractive area when it's developed uh, in a fun place, not just for recreation, but also as a transportation corridor because it'll tie people from Vineyard directly over to the Orem Front Runner Station. So you'll have two communities that can tie right into a major transportation hub. So 
the other cool thing is, is there's there's trees that have grown between this area and the private, you know, the rest of the developed home, the residential areas, mm -hmm. and so you're secluded from the, the residential portion of it. So you're you're out actually away from, you know, civilization, so to speak. And so it really gives a, a kind of a neat, nice nice feel and secluded feel. Okay, if there's no other questions on that, uh, or if you have ideas, what what could we add into that project? We're right in the development phase of that conservation easement agreement between Wakara Way, which there will be a lot of private landowner participation there, and the local communities. What else should we be asking for in this easement? Is someone purchasing the easement, or are they just granting it? I think that the it will likely be granted to a to a nonprofit like entity. Wakara Way will be a, a an entity that will be a land likely be the landholder, uh, or or maybe it'll be a mixed land use, and it'll be a you know a regional area a regional park that has multiple landowners. Because it's, it's going to have to be divided by parcels just for fencing purposes for the grazing of it. I, I ask because I know that Despain, there's a Despain, a conservation easement on the Despain right. property, which I believe Provo City purchased years and years ago. So I, I'm just one, and it wasn't cheap, but they wanted to preserve that area, so they purchased it. It's going to be curious the, if, the Provo River Delta project now, right? Um, I think it's Bulkin north of. I think Despain still has property north of that area. I'm, uh, I'm still. I'm a little foggy. I I would when it comes to projects of these of this magnitude. It, I think it's wise to get professionals involved to help to help get a good design and to get some of the fresh ideas out. Uh, who who probably have worked done done similar work before. My, I, I don't have a ton of experience with lakeside trails. Um, the Jordan River Trail would would give us some ideas, but Juan suggested that there's great ideas in Seattle too. So there's uh, all over, there could be a wide variety of opportunities, and I, I think that by involving professionals, which will cost money, um, would probably be a, a, a wise way to go. Agreed, and and at this play at this stage, uh, we have Mountain Land Association of Governments partnering with us. Uh, we also have our the grant that the commission was provided with through that RTCA, Brandon Stocksdale, mm -hmm. uh, Rivers Trails and Conservation Assistance Program, and so he's a pl he's a trail planner, and he's been Good. helping kind of head it up and make sure that we're including all the right partners. Uh, so at some point down the road, we probably will need, and it most certainly will go to the pre professional planning stage, but right now we're trying to be inclusive and get all these ideas that we can. So if you want more, more participation in it, let us know. We'll include you. We're, we're putting together a steering committee for the project. Right now it will have a, a Provo Orem Vineyard Commission, MAG, Brandon, <coughs> kind of running that. So, okay. So the steering committee will kind of get the ideas, and then when it needs to go to that professional level, an RFP will go out and figure out who who will actually design or, or whatever. Most likely. So, Mountain Land Association of Governments will will probably bring the vast majority of the funding in for the for the trail portion of it. Okay. And then we'll just be working with various funding partners, like the local conservation district, for example, who, who are going to help with some fencing, mm -hmm. or have tentatively committed to helping with some fencing for our initial pilot, so that we can get some cows down there and not have them wandering everywhere. Yes. And so it'll be partners like that that we kind of just bring to the table along the way as we grow it, because maybe it's not that, depending on how much funding we can get all at once, maybe it's something that we just have to develop in phases. Is that the Tempanigo district or the Alpine? Alpine. It's Alpine. I just mm -hmm. never know where the boundary is. I think it's the Alpine. No, it's the one that Dax, does Dax work with multiple? Both, yeah. 
pretty sure it's the Alpine because we've worked with them, and I'm pretty sure I saw that. Okay. Yeah, it's in Bilbo, and I think they're mostly concerned about Spanish Fork and oh, okay. that area, but I just don't know where their boundary is. Okay. Uh, and then there's a field tour. We could probably take a couple extras, but we're taking the Utah Lake, or sorry, the Utah County Commission, the whole commission down on April 11th from 11 or from 1 to 2:30. It'll you meet at the golf course office or the big clubhouse, Sleepy Ridge, Sleepy Ridge, and we go from there. So if you're interested, let me know. And so we're invited to attend. Sure. We want we want folks to come down on these. The moment you get down there, your vision of the place is ten times better than it was prior. Okay. Uh, we're gonna get muddy. As a word of caution, April. If it's nice weather, maybe. bring the mosquito repellent. Yeah, and boots. Make sure you bring some boots because even if we're riding on four wheelers or side by sides, we're gonna get out a few times and get wet. Okay. Uh, recently, we worked with the Division of Water Quality <coughs> and submitted a request for information for algae, algae bloom treatments, uh, not long-term solutions per se, and Scott jump in at any point, uh, but rather we were interested in knowing what was available in the technology world for mechanical, biological, or chemical treatments for blooms. Uh, you know, the, something that we could do tomorrow if needs be kind of a treatment rather than the Utah Lake Water Quality Studies long-term vision where we're addressing the, the nutrient loading and other, you know, long-term solution type things that when addressed properly could, could reduce the, the likelihood of continuing ones in the future. And this is more something to help us when we have a particularly bad year or come across some funding that could allow us to pull that trigger whenever we need to. Uh, we received a, a number of really good uh, responses from this, uh, requests for information. This didn't bind anybody into contractual relationships. It just provided us with information about what was out there. And our plan is to issue an RFP here as fast as we can so that we can work this summer uh, for a pilot study in three, maybe four locations, uh, all marinas, or mostly marinas. Uh, there are, above and beyond just the public marinas around the lake, there's, there's a couple private ones. There's also uh, some private private, if you will, like the McLaughlin Marina that has no use whatsoever right now, uh, where we could potentially... Well, not, not this summer, right? Right. Yeah, for now. Uh, where it could be, uh, some of these things could be tested. So we are going to issue that RFP to maybe get a couple mechanical and a couple treatment type uh, solutions to come to the table for a pilot level project. Uh, so wait for more details, I guess. So we, once we get the RFPs back, we're, we're also kind of working on figuring out which of all the access points would be the ideal for the various types of treatments at a pilot level. So we don't want to put a treatment in that's going to potentially make swimming in that area questionable if, if it's a popular swimming area. So mechanical meaning like stirring the water up? or like Mechanical could be stirring the water. It could be putting a machine out there that sends a signal out that kills algae, it could be a machine that collects, harvests algae. Uh, Air bubblers, ultrasonics. Okay. So there's a, there's a so few things. that Chemical way. Chemical or what was the other option? Chemical? Treatment, is that what we're just, like chemical slash biological, there wasn't a, as many. There's kind of a gamut of, of chemical treatments that you can do, some that are just really long, okay. long standing, like Copper, what is it? Copper sulfate. Copper sulfate. Uh, but then there's some some newer ones that that maybe don't have the the side <coughs> side impacts. 
of, of those historic ones. Alan. Yeah, that's one of the ones on the table. Um, so, I'm just going to add the selection of those projects and this whole RFI process is being led by a committee of lake managers, right? So, Forest Fire State Lands is at the table. I think State Parks or DNR is at the table. Um, wildlife Resources, Fish Wildlife Service, because uh, there are implications to the June, June sucker uh, water quality violations that might happen for some of these chemical ones, like copper sulfate. Sulfate is typically a high risk kind of pollutant, and um, you know we're concerned if that chemical were used, for example, that there could be long term toxicity because copper is just stored in sediment and doesn't really ever go anywhere. Uh, but for some of these mechanical ones with lower risk, they won't have to go through those same kind of permitting hurdles. Right? And so that's where I think you're piloting some of those for this year. Okay. Uh, Marsh, do we have who's our county person here today? Anybody? I thought the county was going to send somebody that I didn't know. Uh, so Marshmasters have been out doing some test work, really just trying to get the mower system working properly. Uh, the mower side of the Marshmaster is not standard product, so they've been outfitting uh, the machine with a mower and kind of working through some issues with, you know, the, it's not a flat surface, and so when they go through ditches or whatever, the mower was not able to go up high enough and it was shutting it off. and. When they put it down too far, it would also shut it off. So they've just been figuring out some details on that um, while they waited for the second mower to arrive for the second machine. So they, they both went out and crushed because uh, historically that was what was done with the Marshmasters is just driving around and smashing it that way. Uh, and as soon as they got the first mower, they've worked through a lot of those issues. I think that they're about at the point where they think that it'll all the problems are ironed out so that when the all the parts for the second one are finally here. They can get that outfitted right the first time, uh, and then they just go to work. And will be they'll, they prioritize this area that I talked about earlier, the other side of the lake. Um, but if it's as fast as we hope it is, uh, we may be able to start heading down south along the east side of the lake, south of of uh, Sandy Beach, uh, clearing up more than than is the primary priority area. Our secondary area is just that the eastern edge of the lake south of, uh, of Provo Bay. Hey Eric, with, uh, with those people, can they help out open the channels that uh, like Spring Creek, I mean, you know, that goes from Provo, Springville area, north of Hubble Creek? That channel has really deteriorated. It's all full of uh, old dead vegetation growth and, 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 and when it dies. There's no, there's no blade on the front. Uh, they do float entirely. They, they, they're, it's, it's a sketchy environment if they need to be on the edge of a, like driving parallel to a stream on the edge of that stream because mm -hmm. if one track gets off the side then it can roll. This is with the mower. This is with the Marshmaster, with the mower, without the mower. Is this with the PMG contractor that is currently doing it? Is this, a this is this. These are the two. So the so we helped pull together five funding sources last year and purchased two Marshmasters, same machine that BMG or PMG uh, uses. Uh, at least they're they have Marshmasters. They also have some bigger tractors, but. Uh, so same same setup. So he invited us up, said, "Hey, take a look. This is how we're doing it." So we kind of copied mostly their their setup with the mower uh, to duplicate, so that we could do it for a fraction of the cost down here around the lake all the, all year long. There's a county crew yeah. that runs them. Yeah. So. Well, I've been talking to the county because I have some upset landowners. Yep, I've been talking with them as well, but. That, it's been off and on whether or not there was a solution. It seems like it needs to be a, an excavator of some sort to just scoop it out of that ditch and, and take it far away from there so that Army Corps is happy. Well, we've been talking with the PMD and the Army Corps and the county, and they say they have a machine that they actually can bring in that is a beam ditch. Oh. Hmm. But the problem is that I'm having with my, uh, with my bosses is that why are you 
I'm trying to get involved in cleaning this channel because I put all my effluent and all my storm water goes through that channel. And right okay. now it's not flowing. So I don't know if we can put it on the utility commission to help us maintain that channel somehow once we figure out what technology to do. Put it on the maintenance. Mowing the sides probably would help not not have the mass or the biomass build up down in the ditch. Mm-hmm. But and and the ditch itself could probably be mowed. Well, this guy says they have a But we won't we won't have that V ditcher. That that's something P, PMG PMG would. will have to do. But is PMG working directly with the commission or is with the utility commission or are they under the county? They're under the can well let me think for a minute. Their contract that brought them down here the first time was with the commission. Um, the commission and the county were kind of one and the same on many things on this front. Uh, and then a landowner called and said, hey, who was it that I gave permission to to come and use that, their machines down here? It looks like they're well equipped to do this kind of stuff. And so he got in touch with PMG and said, hey, can you do this ditch clean out? And and PMG went back to the county and said, "What do you want us to do here? You know, for funding source." But it's not some. The funding wouldn't come from the Lake Commission. It would have to come from from municipalities or the county. Or, like, like could it be, be included in our WRI grant dollars? Maybe could we should have this conversation. So I'll find. Track from the meeting. Okay. Later. Yeah. It's possible. Let's let's keep talking about it. Let's talk about that. Okay. Okay, uh, other invasive work, uh, we've been working with, again with the county. The county in, uh, carries out all of the invasive weed work and, and vegetation work that, that the commission's involved in. So we pull the funding into the, onto the table, and then Utah County's invasive weed program has grant-funded employees, four or five of them now, uh, that most of what they do is work around Utah Lake all year long. They have some other um, assignments as well because they get some smaller grants for other projects in the county, but this is their main work. Uh, so we've been working with them to do Russian olive removal, tamarisk removal in areas where normal Phragmites treatment doesn't do the trick. Uh, so they've been working along uh, vineyard, uh, doing some work over in American Fork uh, by the Boat Harbor, and then also a lot of work along the frontage of the northwest side of the lake, so Saratoga Springs area. So that work continues. Uh, this year, or sorry, next year, we will also be helping with the purchase of a, a farm, what's it called, a forestry tool that goes onto a skid steer that will allow them to more easily address those those Pragmite or uh, tamarisk and Russian olive, they can just mow it uh, with a bucket, some an attachment that goes in place of the bucket on the front, kind of a bull hog. Uh, so that, yeah, so that's continuing. Um, right now, they use uh, hand crews that just go in there and, and cut them down with chainsaws and then they throw it through a shredder. Okay. I also, we've been working on a vision document for the commission uh, that, that kind of goes hand in hand with our master plan, but something that's sh- much shorter, it'll be in the, you know, tiny, tiny stack style, six to 11 pages, something like that. So for this group, we were hoping we could get your participation on adding to the, uh, the evaluation of the of a SWOT analysis both for the commission and for Utah Lake. So this is what we've drafted so far. Uh, and I can read through them. But what else, what are we missing? So strengths, we have local, regional, state partners, information, it's an information hub uh, for Utah Lake issues, uh, resources uh, for multimedia driven promotion, Innovation, innovative approaches to public outreach, successful fourth grade field trips, an education program, uh, the festival, and successful 
annual grant funding for lakeshore restoration work. What are, what other strengths do we have as a commission that we should be thinking about? Collaboration with all of the municipalities. Okay. Is that part of number one? Kind of. Sub I mean, well, I guess you could put municipalities and agencies. Because we have. Can you make a paper? Sorry, I. Any types, yes. I, mean, it's small. I, could, I could make it a little bigger, though. Would it help if you get ready for this? Can I'm offset helping? Yeah, that would help. A little bit. Okay, what municipal collaboration agency? Okay, let's do weaknesses. So we are not a large staff, a limited institutional recognition from the public, it's just a reality. A limited ongoing budget for improvement projects, a partner connection on lake projects. Uh, lake sh Lakeshore office facilities. Any other weaknesses? This is your time to just rail on us. So, so when you say, what's the number two and about public again? Limited institutional recognition for the commission oh. with the public. Yeah. Most people don't know who we are. A lot of people don't know about the access points. Yes. So that'll be a lake one. A Hold lake that one for a moment. We're just looking at just the commission. So, yeah, we have a separate SWOT analysis for the lake specifically. Okay. The lake <coughs> okay. Uh, threats, social media trolls. Uh, surprisingly, it's a, a big deal. People that like to comment. Social media is great for getting information out there, but it's also a magnet for negativity. Um, people that enjoy what you're offering are more passive it seems and those that that want to be troublemakers sometimes it's just helpful sometimes they give great constructive feedback but oftentimes it's um, it's just negativity as you see in newspaper discussion boards uh, inconspicuous to the public public perception of Utah Lake Commission efforts uh, that can be sometimes that's good sometimes like like our treatment of the Phragmites, you know, folks were really concerned in Saratoga Springs about the chemical that were being used mm -hmm. and misperceptions about how widely spread the chemicals were broadcast and things like that. And it can, and it kind of erupted in what we thought was a very positive, we're treating these Phragmites that block the view and ruin the habitat, all of a sudden became a, you know, a, a bit of a, Negative PR campaign. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Other threats might be um, other organizations that try to do something similar that get more notoriety. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. I would say maybe even another threat I'm just thinking about from what Carrie said would be um, organizations that might work against us. There's been the what is it, the Utah Lake Alliance page that has occasionally made insinuations about our work. Or lack. 
Yeah, or lack thereof. Of course, what they think. <clears throat> okay, and you can comment on any of the boxes at any point. But uh, opportunities, leveraging volunteers, the Adopt a Shoreline program, marketing and communications, brand ambassador program, ongoing funding for meaningful lake projects, partnerships with marina operators, tournaments. Additional recreation programs. Along with branding, I would think identity. How so? Well, I think that. Um, and Nature Center. Right? Branding. Sorry. I was just saying, you missed one box. Oh, Nature Center. Oh, yeah. Nature Center. I just see in branding, people, I mean, as we all go and talk about the lake in our various. Entity. Sometimes it's hard to come with one identity, one brand of what the commission is, because there's it's it's very broad in who participates, and um, the scope of of the work is very broad. Um, and we have everything from fish to fragments to recreation, and sometimes it's hard to capture capture all of that for what the public interest is in, yep. in identity. Okay. Yeah, even putting together uh, projects on Utah Lake page on the website, it's there's a lot of information yeah. there. Even just for to get someone to look from top to bottom of that list of, of specific titles of categories is mm -hmm. is a lot to have them get through. So, yeah, getting getting kind of the full message out about the lake can be tough. And okay, is unified messaging. Cap capture that. Anything we can summarize in a mission statement or something? And that's again what this the, what this vision statement is mm -hmm. intended to do is kind of and, and overall just just to give you a kind of what we're shooting for, we want a succinct document that helps guide us on the projects that are most important today. So the master. The, the general plan talks about anything and everything from transportation to long-term planning for projects, development, enhancement all around the lake. What over the next five years or so should the Commission focus on so that we're, we're best addressing today's threats? So that's kind of what we're, what we're hoping to squeeze into this document. Trails. For sure. The Delta Restoration. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Well, I was just thinking, um, you know, kind of related to the branding and the public perception ideas, you guys do a really great job of getting the message out, I think, of what's going on and happenings. But do we, is there a way to improve how we receive input and comment from folks? I mean, do we hear from people a lot unless there's a problem? You know, you go and spray, you don't hear anything until you spray some chemical and then you have 600 <laughs> yeah. people calling all at once, right? I don't know how you, sure. how you do that, but I know in the past, I think the commission's done public survey work or there's, there's, there's Reed did one, what was it, 2013 Reed, I think? We did a public interest survey for the lake. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something we discussed at a conference I was at this week, actually, that um, I'm beginning to try and figure out how I want to proceed on that. But I agree, it's something that we could definitely For my with. project, we're considering a Qualtrics type form that's just out there on our website. So mm -hmm. that folks can, you know, if they see it, feel like they want to respond. I don't know if that's effective or not. But okay. Yeah, we'll definitely talk more about it. Yeah. Are there additional opportunities you've got up there in partnerships with marine operators and stuff? Are there, are there additional opportunities with public private uh, partnerships? I mean, you know, you've got uh, boat sales, dealerships, and stuff, you know, you've got developers, you know, get some sponsorships or whatever to uh, maybe help create some funding for some of your projects.
true. Under strengths, it seems like we could add um, more of the things that are currently in progress. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, there's a lot of work happening on the lake, so whether we're tied directly to it or just partners that are helping encourage those projects to move ahead, I think. Maybe that's what we say to partners. Mm -hmm. Partners. Okay. All right. I think one more thing under strengths, I think uh, because of the partners and collaboration, uh, this, the commission ought to have some good political clout when when necessary. Mm -hmm. Political capital. Mm -hmm. It's not the clout better. Yeah, clout capital. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a challenging one for me. Oh, versus yeah. Um, okay. Well, and in in that, I think too, um, political capital. You have to recognize that's somewhat a weakness too, because we all represent agencies in other areas that are asking for funding on our own, and so as the. Lake Commission then comes forward where they well, didn't we already give you money? Through DNR or through DWQ or through municipalities or through the county. And so sometimes um, that can be a weakness when we're asking and it seems like you're double dipping when you're really not. Just having that political capital then to remind those who have the funding power that you're separate. Keep that in mind. I don't know where to, how to write that. I don't know, but I'm just, just letting you know because I'm thinking I'm at the Capitol every day asking for stuff, right? And yep. I see a lot of people here that or that represent these agencies, and we chit chat about what we're asking for, what we're, which bill we're working on, and and although it indirectly might relate to to what we're doing here, yep. it's still not the same lobbying effort as being there saying I'm representing the Lake Commission today. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> well, and on the bright on the strength side of that. We do have a separate entity now that can request those funds just for the yes. lake, even though you may also be interested in that and may want to pitch for it. There, there is a separate entity that can ask for it that is a new phase of uh, making the request specifically. And mm -hmm. so, Well, I find that if we know, and we're up there, and we know that your person's asking, and then we come in and we talk to those same legislators and say, oh, did you know yeah. we're a member of the lake yes. commission? Um, we heard that this request was asked, are you considering it or, you know, and talk about it from another angle. Yep. Sometimes it just helps them to know it's not just one ask. Agreed. Okay, so. Sorry, I didn't have that in black. Okay, so the lake itself, size is one of its uh, strengths. Abundant recreation opportunities, proximity to population, uh, warm water, year-round opportunities uh, for recreation, fishing and hunting, lakeside living, scenery. Weaknesses, question, questionable water quality, uh, these are perceptions. Sometimes it actually is reality. Carp, uh, proximity to population, lack of known access points, water levels, historic use, overconfidence in lake understanding. I don't know who we're talking about in that statement. Uh, drought, threats, uh, drought, Past, past or continued negative perceptions, algal blooms, nutrient runoff, uh, development, uh, low water levels, 
public perceptions. Opportunities, uh, hunting in addition to fishing, local development, uh, paddle sports in addition to motorized boat use, swimming, cleanliness compared to other recreational bodies, uh, open space, connections to rivers, research, treatment option availability, and community engagement opportunities. Is the restoration project still an opportunity? Yeah. Or a threat. I was going to say, depending <laughs> on who you talk to. Bingo. Right. Well, if, it's, if, it's, it if the threat and the opportunity is there and everyone comes together, maybe the islands. Oh, oh, that one. I just don't associate that term. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Restoring it to. I think another weakness is lack of uh, facilities around the lake, like gas, food, etc., for people who are recreating. We still have not landed on a word that better describes change versus restoration. Oh, was that? I guess the big project. <coughs> yeah. Project. Okay. To me, it's the development. Yeah. Development. That's, that's what they're really after is developable land, right? And so, right. Yeah, land development. I would say they're after it. They have the vehicle for the funding for it, but. That's their ultimate goal. That's their ultimate goal. Without, without goal. funding, it doesn't exist. Using the restoration. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking back on the previous stuff, you know, with our partnerships and stuff, develop more partnerships with, with media groups to present a better image of the lake because there's so much negativity out there with the local, with the general population. You know, all they can think about is the algae and stuff like that. But we generate better partnerships with newspapers, uh, television stations, stuff like that to really present the, the better image of Utah Lake and the adventurous equality. Hard to change that public perception. You got to start somewhere. Okay. So, and our weakness is maybe not just cook carp, but all the racist species. But there are other fish that are. True, that very are true. Northern pike. Never type so well as I do when everyone. when everyone's watching the word letters pop out. Much less type of the letters round. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any others that you can think of right now? We, what I could do is, would it be helpful if I sent this this the two SWOT analyses out to the group so that you could kind of look at it sitting down in your office and go, oh, I, this is the one I was thinking of. Yeah. We will do that. Would it be beneficial to ask on social media, or would you get more sarcastic comments than you would want? If we, if we put it in a survey format, I think we could get just reasonably good responses. Just an idea. Sure. Well, we could try and release it kind of in a stage process. Maybe release it to like our newsletter or something. People we know are generally more supportive first and see how the feedback works and then expand it from there. Mm -hmm. Probably get a lot on the threats and weaknesses. True. <laughs> but if they come media. up with ideas that we didn't, that's a yeah. good thing. Okay. I can appreciate your efforts to bring something to us, ask for our feedback, but I don't view us as the all knowing source. Sure. And if the more people you can get involved, the better product that that we can get from that analysis. But I think it's a good a good thing to help provide guidance and direction for the the near the near future. Okay. Immediate the immediate future. Well, thank you for your help on that, uh, and we'll we'll work on something that you can all participate on for that, as well as attempt to get some public feedback on that. I, I think that's very important. Uh, the communications uh, Utah Lake is my day is my lake. What we're looking for here is some people that you have in mind that are the epitome of, of Utah Lake lovers for whatever reason it may be. We would like a variety of, of interests, whether it be hunters or fishers or water skiers, uh, people that really love the lake that we could 
uh, arrange for interviews with. We're trying to develop us a video series that has people explaining why Utah Lake is their preferred lake. Because there are a lot of these diehards that that really do a good job of, when you sit down and talk to them, you're like, oh, I want that. That's, that's my lake, too. I, I want that to be my favorite lake. Um, any ideas? Yeah. Chris Keller. I think some of those want to keep them secrets, though, you know? They may. may. I'm not telling you where my fishing spot is. I should mention, we've already talked with uh, Todd Fry from Bonneville School of Sailing, and then Scott Root from DWR are two that we kind of initiated the idea with, so we're going to be doing those first. So, I mean, not necessarily agencies, but also public... Oh yeah, yeah. We've also yeah. talked with them. Um, <laughs> yeah, like uh, Clayton Wolf from Vineyard is one we've also been discussing the idea with, and Scott Chipman from the Utah Lake or the Utah Water Ski Club, or some others. So we'd love to have even just residents who love the lake. Kayaker. Dan Potts oh, yeah. will make a great interview. Dan Potts would make a great interview. Mike Mills. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Invested in. The photographers one. Yeah, so I was thinking about Superdale. Does he have good memories having been convicted of a few things of flying over the lake? Yeah. You want something entertaining? Yeah. 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 I like people to watch. Just the photo club that we have. I interfaced with quite a few of them. And they probably would Joe Harvey? Yes. Okay. Levere. Okay, when you when you want, send me your neighbor's contact info. <laughs> I'll contact and if anyone else has neighbors, that I have a, a cousin that he and his wife ski down here <coughs> every day. It's Bless. Fun. Who's Garth Rogers? Do you guys know? Yeah, photographer. Garth, yep, yeah. he actually helped start that photo club. Oh, I okay. I know. He, he's got some great photos. He does. And all phone photos. If he takes them all off the Samsung. Oh, he doesn't oh, use yeah. uh, DSLR. Amazing. Wow, he's got amazing photos. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Lincoln Beach, prior to the... Um, I'm going to have Sam talk about the survey. Uh, but Utah County uh, took the survey results. We're very grateful for them. And they are slowly developing a plan for the, for the, at the newly acquired property, which is Lincoln Point. Uh, just kind of extending around the point from where the marina exists right now. Uh, but they don't have funding necessarily assigned for it at this point. They're working on the plan first, and it'll probably be a phased uh, development. I should note that I checked my email, and it did come on December 14th. So. Oh, okay. Good. I was going to say, I hope I got you on that email. What, I was included. I just forgot. So that's what Eric wanted me to hit on. So um, we sent it out via the technical committee, the governing board. It went on our newsletter. We put it on social media. Um, and in total, we received 553 responses to that survey. Um, residency varied. Um, just looking at the survey again on my phone. Um, some of the larger, at least those that responded, Linden, it looks like, had a large percentage, 15%. Lehigh had a good amount. Um, I'm not sure which one that I is. Payson was 10%. Oh, of course, I have a phone call right now. Did you get an Eagle Mountain response? <laughs> um, I may have. I actually put every city in Utah okay. County on there, and that, and I had a outside of the Utah County option as well, even. Vineyard had a fair amount of response. There were some un- some who selected unincorporated. Um, and then you we actually... This, you send us those results? The results, no. Okay. It was not shared yet to be planned on hitting on it at the governing board meeting. Okay. Um, but I'm vocally sharing it now on this one. Um, so then we also asked, so we asked where they came from. We asked on average, how many times do you visit? We also asked questions like, what are the biggest reasons you don't visit more often? Um, let us know what recreational activities you participate in. What kind of improvements would you like to see? And then we kind of left some open uh, space for them to respond on, you know, any additional ideas or thoughts they had in regards to the access point. Um, in regards to the usage, um, of those that responded, 16% 16% said they were there 11 times or more a year. Um, 23% said they only went one to two times. Three to four times was about 18%. Um, we did have some who had never been there, so I'm glad I put in that option because we were able to filter our results 
when we provided it to the county on those who frequented it most. We wanted to make sure those who lived in the area and those who frequented it most were the answers that were considered with more sincerity, if you will. Um, so some of the summary bits that we put together for the county um, to the question of why don't you visit more regularly, 25% of people surveyed said that Lincoln Beach lacked the necessary year-round amenities. Um, to the question, how often do you visit Lincoln Beach? 40% of people surveyed said that they visited five times or more a year. Um, as to recreational activities, 49% of people surveyed said uh, they use it for boating. 59% of surveyed said fishing. 17% said kayaking, paddleboarding, etc. And 14% who, who were surveyed said camping. And they could respond, they could choose multiple of those. So the percentage is obviously going to be more than 100%. Um, as to what improvements people wanted to see, um, we had 26% said they wanted additional campsites, 31% said they wanted additional paved parking, 15% <laughs> said a deeper harbor, we thought we'd include that just so the county was aware, even though that's not the focus of the project. 84% um, wanted at least one of the following improved, either trails, sandy beach, some kind of activities like a playground or sand volleyball, horseshoes, something like that, access to the warm springs fishing. So there was a significant amount of people who wanted those kinds of improvements. Um, and 44% of the people surveyed said they want year-round restrooms. Um, so we were glad to hear that. That's actually one of the main points of why we put this survey out was a lot of, the, especially the fishing groups that are there year-round, um, were concerned that the restrooms were only open from, I think it's May to October. I think um, that's something that you guys found with your survey in your parks, that they wanted year-round restroom access, even, even oral sales. Sure, access. yeah. Definitely a, a, an interesting point, especially the lake where they're needing those facilities so they're not you know, just going wherever they want. Um, some other additional ideas for improvement that people suggested, they liked the idea of better boating amenities. Um, some people wanted more dumpsters or trash cans is one thing. Um, some additional comments that were made was that the it's bugs are bad. Drop I don't know if there's much that they can thing. do about that, I think. So I um, closer by would be helpful. But yeah, so that kind of sums up, generally speaking, what kind of answers were from it. So we provided our summary report as well as the actual hard data to the county so like eric said they'll be moving forward on those decisions but we were glad to see as many responses as we got Any questions, I guess, on have we partnered with valley visioning at all this county has been putting out some surveys to uh, with the county the municipalities and with um, the business community about as you know utah county is growing we're having over a million new people in the next 20 years. Um, mostly 85% of that will be internal growth, but that might be a, a way for us to partner in on their, um, <coughs> that they're having a stream of transportation and recreation type things, and we might want to partner or at least see what they're doing if we can piggyback. And this is which group gets It's called Valley Visioning. Utah Valley a University is, is kind of heading that up with uh, but it's, it's been going on, and they've been doing um, different um, workshops all, all along the valley recent, more recently, but I don't know why I didn't think that put you in on that at the start. I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> Thanks. I can give you the contact. Okay. The contact on that. Okay. Do you, could you provide an update on the Vineyard Beach? So, there's a couple of projects. Talking about the edge development or sorry, this is the vineyard beach proper uh, okay, that you applied for the county. Yes. Yeah. So uh, and, and I don't have a lot of details, but the existing county facility where they have the beachfront there and, and with a couple of pavilions, uh, shelters and, and whatnot, uh, we we would like to go in there and, and do an enhancement to that to maybe provide a little bit of parking down closer, some restroom facilities. Just, just kind of upgrade it to allow more access. Non-motorized boat uh, boat launch, right? Yeah, I, I don't know all the details there, but... Uh, that much I know. Yeah, so with the information that the county has some funds, we probably would like to reach out and see what the others... And we did, we did write a letter of support for the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation grant that the city applied for for that, for that access point. That's that's a fun one. If if that can get fixed up, it paves the parking lot that's just across the street from the from the access right now by that barrier rail um, trail. Uh, the edge development is going forward. Uh, they've approached about uh, doing some 
participation funds from RDA uh, seem like they're a little bit high, so we've kind of gone in house to put some together some of our own uh, figures for funding and whatnot, and just kind of verify what there's our that's that's also moving forward. So that is grandiose is what the original proposal is, but still an upgrade. And that moves the road alignment, right? Correct. The, the existing road alignment will go back basically under the power line corridor because uh, you can't build under it, so it's a great you know, place for transportation. But we would uh, improve the, the beachfront from their property towards the lake. Uh, there's three, which I don't, there's no one here from the county. Those three pavilions used shelters used to have picnic benches on them. They're gone now, picnic tables, so I don't know if someone now uh, has really? for sale in KSL or in their backyard or whatever. Oh, no. uh, I noticed oh, that no. a couple of days ago, so it wouldn't, be, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to reach out and see. Maybe they're renovating them, I don't know, but uh, they are missing. But uh, we wanted to perhaps add two to three of those shelters and you know, uh, picnic tables and whatnot. Landscape it a little bit better, keep, sure. the, keep the people out, out there. Great. My turn? Oh, yeah, I guess I should be doing that. <laughs> Your turn, Scott. Okay, so um, a lot happening right now with the uh, Utah Lake Water Quality Study. Um, last fall, last summer, I think the steering committee finalized this initial um, high level charge questions, you know, asking the science panel to look into what the historical condition of the lake was, um, looking back to pre-settlement, how it's changed since then over time, um, what, is the cur what are the current interactions in the lake that are important to nutrients and the overall ecological health, um, and then what additional information do we need to help support developing a nutrient criteria, so kind of that second step. Uh, and then a future question, you know, is there an improved state that we can get to some point down the road? So this was kind of the, the baseline structure uh, for the steering or for the science panel. Science panel has been working with these questions to develop more specific key questions, uh, scientifically re related questions under each one. For example, like number one, um, what are nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations stored in sediment cores? So they're starting to look at things like drilling cores in the lake, dating cores, and then seeing if you can see changes in nitrogen and phosphorus. Also looking at other things like photopigments um, that would have been excreted from cyanobacteria over time. Uh, diatoms, di diatom communities change over time with changes in vegetation and nutrient concentrations. So they're starting to piece together what information they need to kind of build a historical timeline for the lake. Uh, and then similarly for uh, number two, you know, the big questions here are um, what are the, one of the more important questions right now is what's happening at the sediment water interface. You know, if we were to reduce all of the nutrients coming into the lake right now, what role would the sediment nutrients have in uh, continuing growth of cyanobacteria? So would it happen for a short period of time? Would it happen for 50 years? You know, so we know what kind of lifetime we might be dealing with with those legacy sediments. And we'll also... On that same one, they'll be testing 30 centimeters down. They'll be testing the same water sediment in interaction or potential interaction to figure out uh, what that would look like if the whole lake were dredged 30 centimeters to go back to the prehistoric layer uh, that wouldn't necessarily be charged with so many nutrients that we have in there today just to see if that maybe there was enough nutrient in that in the natural cycling back in the day, but maybe not. So that'll be part of that. One of the reasons um, you know, when we develop nutrient criteria, one approach, there's a handful of approaches that we use, but one approach is to use, to look at the reference condition. Um, in other areas, the way you do that is you take a population of lakes or streams and you compare them and then their relative level of disturbance. But where Utah Lake is so unique, there's nothing to really compare it to. Uh, and so the, really the only other way to kind of get an idea of the reference condition is to look back in the sediments um, and see what it looks like from there. Uh, so to help support the science panel um, to complete that initial charge, there's a lot of work built in that initial charge. 
and in October, when was that? Oh, at the beginning of the year, uh, we finalized the contract. We put out an RFP last fall to request uh, contractual support. Um, had a number of bids, had the science panel weigh in on which one they thought was most qualified, and then uh, rolled out with a contract, selected a contractor, rolled out a contract right at the first of the year this year, um, awarding the, the contract to Tetra Tech uh, and a team led by Dr. Michael Paul. And Mike Paul is a national nutrient expert. He's been involved in more than a dozen or so nutrient criteria development cases around the country. Uh, really high profile ones like Florida that were you know, a decade in the making uh, had some pretty unique challenges associated with it. So uh, we feel really confident in the team that we have um, and their work plan is essentially this diagram here. Uh, everything that we're working towards in this phase of the work is to develop a strategic research plan to help us guide data collection over the next couple years so that we can collect the missing pieces of information we need to be able to then start developing that nutrient criteria. Um, I'm just gonna kind of work backwards from the product, but the framework, well maybe I'll, I won't, but. Um, so this idea of conceptual modeling has been with the science panel for a while now. Uh, and really the idea here is, you know, you start with sources that are top of this graph. So we have various uh, nutrient sources coming into the lake. Sorry, that's so hard to read. Um, and it'd be bottom, more confusing if we could read it. Yeah. At the bottom, <laughs> you have um, the uses that we're trying to protect for, aquatic life, agriculture, and recreation. And then in the middle are all the various interactions that are happening with nutrients, growing algae, various conversions of nutrients, and those kinds of things. And so the science panel is starting to develop this so that they can understand what areas they need to focus their effort and time on. Um, and also, once you identify those critical linkages, you can then use that information to develop the approaches that you would use to establish criteria uh, and focus your research. Um, we have an analysis plan item. Um, I, think, I think I've demoed this Shiny app for this group before, um, and this is something that uh, Jake Vanderlaan in my office put together. It's a, it's a really cool tool that you can go online and click through various water chemistry parameters and kind of see what's happening for everything we've collected for the last 30 years in Utah Lake. Uh, this analysis plan is to take that a next step further. The science panel's identified a number of questions that need to be teased out of the data. And so Tetra Tech's developing that analysis plan right now. And we'll be um, implementing that plan in the next month or two to start uh, doing those analyses. And the product will be uh, an shiny app just like this you can just go into a web page and anyone can click through those various analyses and see the results and and look at the data in, in their own way so um, I think it'll be a really interesting product for this uh, near-term research priorities so um, science panels identified a number of things that they kind of need to know right now to help inform future work and we're also trying to gear up this season to kind of capitalize on the field season and also to utilize some funding that has uh, some timelines, tight timelines attached to it. Uh, and so those, the top portion here, the historical nu nutrient condition, those paleo studies that I was talking about, uh, we spent, we had two days of meetings earlier this week and uh, spent a good bit of time developing an actual RFP to sketch out how we uh, put a bid out for this particular work. And then the second group here is the, the uh, phosphorus sediment component. So two critical items. So we're hoping to be able to develop a full work plan and work through our procurement process um, with uh, kind of a target date of end of June, early July to award some of, the, some of this work. And then this, uh, the nutrient criteria framework. So this is the product that's going to pull all of those pieces together and outline the various approaches that we might use to um, establish a criteria. Uh, and what we're thinking is that you use a multiple lines of evidence approach, right? So we're currently developing, uh, the University of Utah is currently developing a mechanistic model um, to, on Utah Lake to figure out how nutrients interact and grow algae. That is one, one line of evidence. Um, you can go and you can empirically look at all of the data to see 
you know, how chlorophyll might change over time in response to phosphorus. Uh, that could be a line of evidence. Um, you could look at that reference condition like I talked about before, another line of evidence. Not any one of those, you wouldn't take any one of those on their own to come up with an answer just because of the variability and uncertainty that might be associated with each one. But collectively, you can look at those pieces and uh, try to figure out you know, what number for nitrogen and phosphorus is protective of the uses. Um, and so this criteria framework document, we're currently now doing a literature review that we have a have a draft of. How have other states looked at these various lines of evidence? How have they used them to inform their nutrient programs? Um, so we have a draft of that the science panel is currently reviewing. Uh, and then the next step is to develop this framework, the actual approach, how we'll use each one of these, the data that we'll use for them, um, how the data will form each one, and then how at the end of the day we get to a number. Yeah, so when you get to the when we get back to here, after that framework, we'll have the framework and the strategic research plan, uh, and then we'll start collecting, doing the research that's needed to fill in those gaps. Uh, and then a future phase of the study, I'm suspecting you know, next year or maybe a little beyond, will be to package all those products together, uh, apply the data that we've collected to that framework, and then um, you know, move towards developing a number. Questions? Are you getting good participation from all of the steering committee members? Uh, from the science panel, we're, we're not interacting too much with the steering committee right now. Um, the answer is yes, we do when we have steering committee meetings. Our last steering committee meeting was in December, I think the 6th, uh, where we're moving more towards the lifting. The science panel is really engaged right now. Uh, we're not planning to meet with the um, steering committee until the May time frame. This, the science panel is the group of scientists yeah. that are advising on right and the science panel we are getting <clears throat> excuse me really good participation you know occasionally both um, from them and the public and for the record yeah and the public um, but you know occasionally we'll have one person missing or not be able to make it one or two from the meeting but we almost always have eight of the ten at the table um, so yeah it's it's been a really Good process. Is, is, is the timeline meeting your expectations? Is it slower than or um, more accelerated than what you were expecting or hoping? Well, I think it's a reasonable timeline. I don't know. I thought I'd be done with this two years ago, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. So. That's a little bit too. That's a little bit messy, but. Um, I think it's a reasonable timeline. I think we're on track now. You know, I feel like. With the amount of work that this has been over the last, for me and my contractors, um, it's been tough to keep up with. So in that sense, it might be a bit too aggressive, but uh, in terms of where we need to be in the overall project goal, I think we're probably on track. Okay. Um, some of that's gonna depend on how long it takes to do some of this research. That's something that's always been hard to how long can I expect a contractor to go out and collect paleo cores and do the analysis and get back to me with the report and the data? Um, is that a month? Is that a year and a half? I don't, I don't really know. Um, so our project timeline, you know, we met with the science panel for day and a half, our day back on February 8th. We just had a day and a half of meetings uh, early this week. Our next interaction is the 25th, 26th, and then a couple calls. Um, we, uh, the topics on the right here, those are, those are designed to support the Tetra Tech work. So we had those engage these engagements scheduled so that we can feed products to the science panel. The science panel can provide input and direction to Tetra Tech. Uh, so we have that feedback mechanism. Uh, and then we're targeting, we're not sure on the date yet, but another steering committee meeting in May. Uh, and the purpose of that will be just to kind of touch base, but also to report out on some of the science panel products, um, have the steering committee weigh in on you know what they think about them, uh, and then the last half of the year, um, we have a series of meetings that are kind of sketched out that aren't really scheduled. Uh, I think the last one we have on the books is the April twenty fifth, or no, we've scheduled July, I think. Uh, yeah. Anyway, anybody have any other questions for Scott? Um, 
Anything else, Scott? A couple other items, okay. just quickly. Um, I'm sort of related to this, but more around the implementation side of things. Um, I'm working with the Utah County Stormwater Coalition and our stormwater folks um, to implement a stormwater monitoring network. So the Division of Water Qualities uh, received some funding to put out three telemetry real-time uh, automated trigger type systems that we can put on three of high, prior, high priority storm drains or drain systems to help start quantifying stormwater loading to the lake. Uh, Carl Adams is actually with the Stormwater Coalition right now, um, having uh, probably providing an update on this. So we're about to acquire the equipment. We're getting bids right now, so we'll be purchasing that in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, we are trying to, to help us in prioritizing where those sites need to be. We're requesting uh, stormwater infrastructure GIS data from all of the municipalities around the lake. Um, so I think I have four municipalities so far um, working with the stormwater folks. And so for those of you that are here, I don't think, you know, I haven't heard much from Provo. Um, I'm not sure about Vineyard and, and uh, Saratoga Springs and others, um, but if you wouldn't mind helping me acquire some of the infrastructure data, that would be pretty helpful. What do you need? Um, do, so we have, we have all of that. Yeah, in, I know you do. In, uh, GIS. GIS. Yeah, we're, we're just looking for GIS layers of like outfalls, catchment areas, um, conveyance system, retention, detention. Okay, I can um, tell you who to contact. Oh, that'd be awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll just Looking afterwards, <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Um, the second, the second use for that information is uh, to help the University of Utah um, complete their swim stormwater model. So they need to know certain features like retention, detention, so that they can accurately simulate simulate how stormwater flows are conveyed through the system into the lake, what when it makes it to the lake, and what the quality of the water is. So, do you want to? <clears throat> I think it might be of interest to the group the headwater criteria sure. that potentially has a positive impact on the lake? Yeah, um, so I'm not terribly connected to that project, but I know um, our Jeff Ostermiller in our shop has been working over the last number of years to develop a, a headwater nutrient criteria. So numbers for nitrogen and phosphorus that are protective of the use for any stream that's in the Forest Service boundary. So headwater streams, um, these are typically the streams that had the least amount of impact to nutrients. Uh, and I think when, our, when I was connected with that project four or five years ago, only like four or five percent of all streams were showing some kind of nutrient impairment. So a relatively small number statewide compared to, you know, more urban areas like this. Um, so Jeff's been working through that project and has actually finished the document and the recommendations um, and presented, has worked with the stakeholder group, much like the steering committee. Um, they've passed off on that and he made a presentation to the Water Quality Board to initiate rulemaking yesterday. So um, it's likely, you know, we have to go through public comment and things, but it's likely that that will be wrapped up in the next few months. Um, EPA is asking some questions that we have to, they have to navigate through um, and address their concerns, but um, yeah, so that will establish, uh, it's an interesting approach. I mentioned multiple lines of evidence. Um, they're not just picking a nutrient number of nitrogen or phosphorus. Those uh, nutrient values have to be paired with some kind of response in the system. So they're looking at ecosystem respiration and dissolved oxygen. So if those numbers fall below certain, certain thresholds and you have a nutrient value of a certain amount, um, the two are combined together to determine whether the, um, the system is supporting its use or not. So the combined criteria, which could be something that could be something that happens on Utah Lake too. I, I see the value as assuring that our, our stream sources are healthy so that by the time they're reaching the lake, any problems are our own fault. Uh, and that also our mountain lakes uh, potentially have the ability to be uh, helped out a little bit so that our Payson lakes or our, some of these lakes that have been having strange blooms, some of those problems that are unique may be fixed. So for those that are uh, 
in communities that, that have mountain lakes nearby, that could be a, of interest to you. Okay. Next. Anything else, Scott? Yep. All right, uh, next is an update from the June Sucker Recovery Program. I don't see Mike Mills here. Um, do you know anything about that, Mike? Since I don't. You're the Sorry. Next closest to him. Yeah. Like, same name? Yeah. <laughs> well, they work in the same. same and the same time. No, he is a couple doors down from me, but he, he didn't give me any sort of update to share, so I don't. Okay. You have you from from our last. They're they're working on. They're kind of in study phase. They're trying to figure out the details of the, of the, maintenance uh, northern kite cart or northern pike. Uh, they're doing modeling on that with USU to figure out how fast they're going to grow and how fast they're going to destroy the lake. Being pessimistic, uh, and then their carp. Uh, numbers they've figured out their maintenance mode and so they're switching gears into that maintenance mode a million pounds of carp per year versus three and a half to four uh, northern pike are a big problem but they are they are working on figuring out multiple different ways to kind of address the the d increase in population there uh, otherwise we could wait for him to okay. All right, uh, next agenda item is an opportunity for anybody in here that would like to provide an update of any uh, lake efforts your agency or municipality or group are working on or uh, ask for advice, whatever. So start over here with Spanish Fork. Nothing. Lonnie? Mike? I'm good. Okay. Can I make one more thing? It's short, super short. All right, that's <laughs> Morgan Faulkner replaced Ben Styerman in this region. So if there are permit requests that you need for Utah Lake related issues, they go to Morgan. Okay. Where did Ben go? He um, is just technically working Weaver on rivers River. now, so he's still the division and we're still working together. He's still doing some Utah Lake stuff, but I'm taking up with most of the Utah Lake stuff. Okay. Great. Okay. All right, keep going. Ethan, Sarah, Lyndon, Solar. Good. That was the fastest agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> and we have no public here, so a reminder to everybody that the next meeting will be is scheduled for May fifteenth at nine thirty here. Festival. June first. June first. Utah Lake Festival. Yeah, what is the Utah Lake Festival? June first. Okay, we'll stand adjourned. Thanks. Thank you. The 20 March 21st.